Well, hello everybody. This is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. Uh, so today I'm going to continue talking uh, about the uh, introductory ventilator uh, man ventilator setup, rather initiating uh, mechanical ventilation therapy. And we talked about some of the initial settings, and I want to talk about a couple of other initial settings that you will run across. Uh, these are going to become a bit more relevant in what I like to call the phase two or a phase two of ventilator management. And this is actually when we start fine tuning the ventilator to, to meet. Uh, the specific demands of the patient or or to uh, meet specific uh, physiological demands or um, to uh, attempt to treat or correct for certain types of pathology. Um, so that probably won't occur until next week in, uh, well, it actually, actually won't occur until next week in, in the class I'm teaching, but I do want to try to push through and get all the videos out for the initial ventilator setup uh, by the end of this week. Um, so the two variables or the two settings I'm looking at are, are, are something known as flow or peak inspiratory flow and inspiratory time. Now, traditionally, and actually, before I talk about, about uh, what, what occurred traditionally, just know that flow and inspiratory time really are two parts of the same concept, and that is how fast can I get my volume in? If so, let's say I have a tidal volume of 500 put in, uh, set into my ventilator, it's in volume control ventilation, how fast or how long does it take to get that volume in? And obviously this is very important, how much time do I spend um, in, um, in in inspiration, and we can we can control that by two one of two two ways. We can either control that by the flow, and that's how fast gas flows um, is is basically pushed into our lungs by the ventilator, and then we can also control um, it directly through the inspiratory time. Now you can see the two the two are connected because if I have a say a long inspiratory time, it takes a long time to get air into my lungs. Well. The intuition would be, well, if the inspiratory time was long, then the flow would need to be short. I need to have a low flow because gas would need to flow in slower and able to have a longer inspiratory time. It take more time to get in. So you can see these two things are really interrelated. And likewise, um, if my inspiratory time was very short and gas was flowing into my lungs very quickly, then the flow, again, would have to be very quick. So... When we talk about tradition, traditionally what we did is when we had somebody in volume control ventilation, volume cycle ventilation, we could we would control or could control the the um, inspiratory time through the flow. So in volume control ventilation, traditionally what we do is we'd increase or decrease the flow. And increasing or decreasing the flow would, of course, uh, cause the inspiratory time to go up and down. Now, um, traditionally, when we were in pressure-controlled ventilation, in pressure-controlled ventilation, we'd actually set an inspiratory time. And it was the actual inspiratory time that would determine the flow. So volume control, flow determines the inspiratory time, pressure control inspiratory time determines the flow. Now that with the, the more modern microprocessing processor ventilators um, such as the, the Maquette Servo I and the Puritan Bennett 840 and, and some of these other ventilators, um, this has really become mixed up and a lot of the ventilators allow you to, uh, in volume control, you have an inspiratory time. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of mixing, a little bit of gray area here. Um, but I just wanted to at least introduce you to the concept of flow and inspiratory time, and certainly you have been introduced to these concepts in your um, respiratory anatomy and physiology courses that you took the first semester, and uh, certainly in your uh, physics course, uh, coursework that you had to take the first and second semester um, of the respiratory therapy program. And it, uh, if you're not, if you're actually not from respiratory therapy and watching these videos, um, I do have some other videos on the respiratory physics playlist and you're more than welcome to, to look through those and kind of um, kind of get yourself up to speed if, if you're having any confusion as to what I'm talking about. So what is a normal flow and what we we'll call the normal adult patient without any um, underlying lung pathology and of course um, we, we always have normal patients with no underlying lung pathology um, in the clinical setting, right? 
well no, but let's just get a baseline for what a normal flow would be in a patient. Say maybe a patient um, that's coming out of the OR and they haven't had any sort of lung issues. Um, you know, maybe they had uh, some orthopedic work done on an arm or a legs, and they don't have any underlying in, uh, any underlying pulmonary issues. Then, then this this flow would be probably more relevant. But but the normal flow we look at anywhere between thirty to sixty liters per minute. And if we convert liters per minute to liters per second, because when we talk about inspiratory time, we're actually dealing um, on the line of seconds, not minutes. Um, so 60 liters per minute would be one liter per second. And then 30 liters per minute would be 0 0.5 liters per second. So um, just to give you a, kind of an idea of um, what the how the flow kind of relates to time, so the normal flow is about thirty to lead, uh, sixty liters per minute. So that means if I were to put a patient in volume control ventilation and I were to give them a tidal volume of five hundred milliliters, um, the, the way I'd have to find out how fast that five hundred milliliters would be delivered if I was just using flow is I would have to take my flow in liters per minute and convert that to liters per second. And um, you, you, you guys should be pretty familiar with the dimensional analysis uh, by now. And I've certainly done some videos on that if you need to refresh yourself. Um, but let's just take 60 liters per minute. So every minute, there are 60 liters. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to divide that by 60, right? There are uh, 60 seconds in one minute. And that's how I can convert that, that 60 liters per minute to liters per second. 60 goes into 60 one time, so 60 liters per minute equals one second. Um, likewise, 30 liters per minute, well, 30 goes on top, and then I divide 30 by 60 seconds, and 60 doesn't go into 30, right? Um, how much um, does 60 go into 30? Well, that's that's just um, you know simply uh, uh, moving some decimal points around, and you'll find out that 60 uh, goes into 30 0 0.5 times. So 60 liters per minute will be 1 liter per second, and 30 liters per minute will be 0 0.5 liters per second. So looking at my original volume of 500 milliliters, if I were to put my flow at 30 liters per minute, that's 0 0.5 liters per second, or 500 milliliters per second. So it would take one second to deliver the volume of 500 milliliters. And this is the kind of math we're dealing with. And I know that um, people do tend to struggle a little bit with the math. And, and, and I, I think um, if, if we just look at it as simple dimensional analysis and simple division, the kind of stuff we do in grade school and not try to make it too scary by injecting all these terms like I time flow and all this physiology and, and perhaps make it more of just a pure math problem um, it, it'll be a little bit more intuitively um, easy to understand and even, perhaps I'll even do some videos on on the basic um, applied mathematics that, that we're talking about here okay so flow we I, th I think we've got a good introduction to that let's talk about the inspiratory time um, again, eye time will determine the flow. A normal eye time is about 0 0.8 to 1 second in an um, average adult patient. Now, if somebody has a problem with, uh, let's say, air trapping, let's say they have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and they have um, airflow obstruction or increased airway resistance, um, we're going to need to probably shorten the eye time a little bit and um, make the E time a little longer, right? If my, my I time is short, my E time, my expiratory time will be long. If my expiratory time is long, my I time will be short. So in the case of COPD, I probably want a little shorter um, I time, get the gas in quick, and allow a little more time for exhalation so I don't have air trapping. So I can do that in pressure control ventilation by making a shorter eye time or in volume control ventilation by increasing the flow, by increasing the flow to decrease the eye time. Now, if I have somebody with, with some oxygenation issue, uh, one thing I can consider doing is increasing the eye time. That, of course, um, increases the amount of time that I'm inhaling. It increases the amount of time that the alveoli are open. 
and of course that increases the alve the alveolar uh, capillary membrane surface area and allows for more diffusion to occur. Now, uh, having prolonged eye times can be inherently dangerous, and I'm going to talk about um, inverse uh, IDE ratio uh, ventilation at, a, at another time, but, but it is something to consider, and it is um, somewhat inherently dangerous. Okay, so this is a basic introduction to flow and eye time. Uh, I think in the next video we'll be talking about the something known as the IDE ratio, and we'll probably do a little bit of math there. Okay, guys, have a great day.